Hello out there and welcome to our Halloween edition of College Countdown. I'm Jimmy Birch. I'm Carlos Mendez. And you can see it's also Race Week edition. This is the Race Week edition. Jimmy, let's kick around the uh, four survivors out of Texas and into Homestead. Well, that would be uh, a lot of guys that drive fast and turn left. Yeah, they go very fast. That's right. And uh, in terms of the people, the four survivors, one of them in the college football world, one of those four survivors could be those TCU Horn Frogs play right here in Fort Worth, Texas. They got a big game. Well, Huge they sure game. do. They sure do. They've got a big game this week, and if they win it, they've got a big game next week. You know, this is another two-step yeah. here with West Virginia and Kansas State, just like they opened the conference season mm -hmm. with OU and Baylor. They almost got through that OU and Baylor pair, and now they've got another one to try to get through. But this one's going to be on the road. It's a different environment, different weather. You know, they're going to play in rain for the first time a this year. A different weather thing I think is going to be huge, especially the 40 degrees in the rain. Yeah, it is, and uh, Gary Patterson talked about it at practice this week. Um, you know, he was playful about it. He said, you know, gives you a chance to at least, you know, wear long underwear. You don't have to change at halftime because you haven't been sweating <laughs> right. the whole game. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he did say pointedly that the team that runs the ball better is going to have an advantage in this game. And that'll be interesting. Yeah, and that's an area where, you know, TCU has made strides, West Virginia has made strides. You know, West Virginia has improved its defense. They beat Baylor, which TCU could not do. But TCU has been the best defense. Them or Texas has been the best defense in the conference all year. So this right. is really a fascinating matchup. I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens. Yeah, one, one thing that's on the line there, it's, you know, potential coach of the year, some player of the year type stuff. These are the two big turnaround teams in the Big 12 picked – seventh and eighth to start the year and you know essentially playing to to see who joins kansas state you know riding along the inside rail down the stretch it's going yeah, to be there, fascinating there's a lot of storylines in this game can't wait to get to it mm -hmm. but um anyway the uh college football playoff rankings came out they did and i know you were there I was that there. night and that was a big day for you know uh tc one of the big surprises in that uh you know, pleasant surprises for, for the Big 12. I mean, that's one of the big takeaways to me. You got TCU seven, Kansas State nine, both significantly uh, higher, uh, at least a couple of spots per team, three spots for TCU, higher than they were in the uh, regular polls, the weekly polls. And, you know, that's significant for the Big 12. You got national respect without having the involvement of Texas or Oklahoma. You're two name brand programs and that says a lot about what the committee thinks about the quality of Big 12 football. It also says a lot about what they think about the quality of Big 10 football when Ohio State is, has one loss in their 16th and Michigan State can't rise above 8th despite being 5th in the coaches poll. I thought that was encouraging for the rest of the nation. Um, Notre Dame at 10, minor surprise, their name brand program. They. Uh, the committee seems to be holding strong with you got to play somebody and Baylor hope you're listening that's why you're 13th um, as we look around the rest of the state some people that uh, did not make those rankings one of those would be the Texas A&M Aggies who are riding a pretty dismal three game losing streak and uh, talking about making a change at quarterback taking our um, Tarrant County product Kenny Hill out of the lineup Southlake Carroll uh, standout for years Job's been open for most of eight or nine days. Probably be a game time decision. You you ride with Kenny? Do you go with the freshman, uh, Kyle Allen? What would you do, Coach? Well, I would ride with my my best quarterback. And if I decided my best quarterback in August was Kenny Hill, he's still my best quarterback. Mm -hmm. Problem is, you're not protecting him. You're not helping him out. You're just playing bad football around him. Now, part of that has been, has got to be him too. Mm -hmm. He's a young guy. He's influenced by what's around him, too. He's not making good decisions. This is where coaching plays a big part in his development. Somebody's got to settle him down, build his confidence back up. This new kid that you want to use, unless you are better around him, he's going to end up with the same problems that Kenny Hill did at the end of the year. You're going to have two quarterbacks with reduced confidence going into the spring. So I'd stick with Kenny, try to make that work. Next spring is where you open the job back up if you weren't satisfied. Okay, I'll, I'll flip that around and kind of explain why why I think A&M uh, is tempted by this and maybe making uh, a good move to do this. Uh, you got a freshman five-star signee from the state of Arizona that you know. Let's be honest, K 
kids transfer all the time when they come to out-of-state programs, don't win the job, don't get to play much. You got the season has kind of gone down, uh, gone not, that, gone down, not down the drain, but <laughs> your championship hopes are gone. Kenny's really struggled. It was a close competition this spring. Uh, best time in the world to test drive a uh, new quarterback is after an open date and against a really overmatched opponent at home. And A&M's got both of those things on the table Saturday playing uh, Louisiana Monroe. So I, I kind of think from a recruiting standpoint, I understand why uh, Sumlin and company want to see what Kyle Allen can do if they go that way. And if they stick with Kenny, I still think Allen takes a fair number of starts and uh, a number of snaps in those games. That uh, you know that you know A&M at this point is kind of playing the rest of the year to settle that quarterback issue for next year. I think. Yeah, they've got some things to figure out. Um, but let's talk about another team that's got some things to figure out. That's SMU. They do. And we're talking about them mainly How because. How to score touchdowns? <laughs> No, they've done that a couple oh, times. Oh, okay. Already. I'm sorry. They've done they, that. they didn't scratch that off the list. Okay. But they do need a coach. They do. They've got a guy now, but uh, they've been talking about Mac Brown a little bit. At least, uh, at least we in the media have. Right. Yeah. A few, a few boosters have. Yeah. There seem to be a a, 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 a group of boosters that are interested in making a run at him, like they did with Larry Brown. Yeah. yeah. And I think this might work out for a, even a couple of years, just because Mac is a handshaker. He's a fundraiser. He can get get you some boosters lined up to help the program out and get some interest in it, put some money into it, and see if you can at least get some credibility going just off of Mac Brown's name. I think that's what SMU needs is just to get his feet under it. You know, Mac Brown, we're not asking, nobody's asking him to coach for 10 years there. Just give them mm -hmm. a couple and rebuild that program's roots a little bit. I'll, I'll agree that that would be great if Mac was the basketball coach like Larry Brown is. It, with Mac being the football coach and that program probably headed to our, an 0-12 record. I, mean, I disagree. I think they need to go young. They need to go hungry. They need to get somebody in there who's more of a tail twister on, uh, with a fancy, exciting offense that'll put people in the seats and would uh, beat the bushes uh, for more obscure recruits. Mac has a great recruiting reputation, but he, he earned that at Texas, where all he had to do was throw open the uh, door and say, look at this. And uh, at SMU, you got to work a little harder at recruiting than that. And I, a guy I really like, that I, Lincoln Riley is the offensive coordinator at East Carolina. He was on the Texas Tech staff there with Leach. He's done a phenomenal job. They're top 25 team. That's the secret behind the rise of East Carolina under Ruffin McNeil. Texas Tech graduate, Muleshoe, Texas, 32 years old. And Gil Brandt told me six years ago, watch this guy. He's going to be a great college coach, and it's not going to take long. Um, I think that would be somebody for SME to jump in with both feet. And, you know, that Brent Venables also be a good option. There's plenty of people out there. I just think they got to go younger. But regardless of where SMU goes, we got to go. We're going to the track. Are you going to the fo football games? Wherever you're headed this week, have a good week out there. Take care.